it is really important to make sure that our programs terminate. There's hardly a worse situation than to be using a computer or some other kind of computing device and suddenly to see it stop responding because it has engaged in some kind of endless computation. Usually it's because of a loop that does not terminate. So we're going to learn how to avoid that phenomenon, in particular to make sure that all of our loops terminate, and the key idea will be to associate with every loop what is known as a loop variant. This will also give us a window on some really important uh, pro uh, properties and problems of computer science and uh, mathematics, the problem of termination and the problem of undecidability. We start by looking again at the structure of loops. We saw in the last lecture that uh, in order to uh, determine the correctness of a loop, we need an invariant clause. Uh, however, this only gives us the correctness if the loop terminates. We have said nothing about termination so far. So we must also, as a complementary technique, use a variant, which is going to be the guarantee that the loop uh, terminates. The variant clause introduces a variant expression. Unlike the invariant expression, which was Boolean, the variant expression is an integer expression. And in fact, its values are going to be not just integers, but natural integers, non-negative integers. They can be zero, they can be positive, but they cannot be negative. To see how we are going to use this clause and the underlying concept, let's come back to our standard example of loops. This is the example from the previous lecture, and as you remember, what it does is that it goes through a list of stations, and at each point uh, through the loop, it's going to move the cursor by one position. How do we know that it terminates? Well. Each time through the loop, it does this C dot force, which advances the cursor. And the exit condition is C dot after, which is true only if the cursor is after the last element. So it's clear intuitively that eventually we're going to reach that position by doing these C dot force repeatedly. However, intuition is not good enough, and we're going to need a general rule to ascertain that this loop and any loop terminates. Before we look at that rule, let's take another example. This is a loop that computes the sum of all the numbers from 1 to n, where n is positive, an integer, of course. First, we need to make sure that the loop is correct, regardless of termination. How do we know that it actually computes the sigma of i from 1 to n if it terminates? Well. The technique to ascertain this, as you remember from the previous lecture, is to use an invariant. And uh, the, my first question is, uh, what is the invariant in this case? Well, I hope you got it. The invariant is going to tell us first that i remains less than or equal to n plus 1. This is quite important. i is also non-negative. And also, the most important part of the invariant is that at some point, since at the end we want the result to be equal to this whole sum, at some point, uh, at uh, after the ith iteration, we have result which is actually equal to the sum from j to from one to i minus one of j. Okay, so this is what gives us the final value that we want, because in the end, i will be equal to n plus 1, and so the result will be the sum that we want. Okay, so this is the correctness argument, but it only holds if the loop does terminate. So does it terminate? Yeah, the, the answer is yes. It's pretty clear that it terminates here, because we are taking an i which starts at 0, and we are stopping as soon as i is greater than n, and since i can only increase, this is going to happen sooner or later. But again, this is a very informal intuitive argument, and we need better than this, especially since it's quite easy to make a mistake which will result in the loop not terminating. And the technique is the loop variant. What is a loop variant? It's an integer expression that has the following two properties. It's very simple in the end. 
the variant must be non-negative after initialization. Remember that the loop always begins with an initialization in even an empty one. And then most importantly, it's going to decrease. And because it's an integer, decreasing means decreasing by at least one. Whenever the loop body is executed, however, in decreasing, it remains non-negative. So that's the idea. You have a, an integer quantity that is always non-negative, and every time through the loop, it decreases by at least one. And so you see the idea. As uh, soon as we have a, a quantity like this, which is never negative and which decreases by one again and again, well, we know that the process cannot go on forever. We cannot forever have an integer that goes down and down and down each time by at least one, uh, while remaining always non-negative. Notice, by the way, that this would not be true if instead of integers we had mathematically rational numbers or real numbers, because it's well known that we can have a value that decreases and decreases a little less and decreases a little less again and so on, and this goes on forever. That's why the integer has to be, the variant has to be an integer, uh, but with an integer, we are guaranteed that the process doesn't last forever. Note, by the way, that we only need the variant to decrease when the loop body is executed with the exit condition not satisfied, because when the exit condition is satisfied, we, we don't care, uh, since the loop body is not going to be executed. We have the same observation in the case of the invariant. So what is the variant in our examples? In, in this particular case, I'll give it to you. Then for the next one, for the next example, I'll ask you to find it. In this case, we have once again our list. And we have here c.count. I'm just going to write count. We know, we know that it's uh, c.count. And here we have index which is going to increase each time. Index is the position of the cursor starting at one. And again, it's not index, it's C dot index. So what is decreasing and never becoming zero? Well, obviously we have to take count. Let me write it properly this time. C dot count minus C dot index. That decreases each time since count doesn't change. We're not changing the list while traversing it and index increases, so c dot count minus c dot index decreases. And I hope you're ahead of me here. That is to say this is not quite correct as a variant because the variant must always remain non-negative. And so c dot count minus c dot index is not good enough. We need plus one to make sure that the variant is still non-negative at the very end. So that's our variant. And you see how this particular loop terminates is because we are getting closer and closer to the end of the list and because the list is finite we cannot go on forever the fact that the list is finite comes from the presence of count so here is our variant and this is what we must write in the variant clause of the loop although it's not been written here i've added it now at the end So what is the variant in this case? What is the property that the, the expression that guarantees that the loop terminates? Well, it's actually very simple and very similar to the previous case. It's n minus i. And once again, we must be sure that it never becomes negative. So we have n minus i plus 1. In fact, it's not surprising that it's similar to the previous case because in both cases, we had a relatively simple case of a loop for which the number of iterations is fixed and known in advance. The count in the previous case and n in this case. Not all loops, of course, have a fixed number of iterations and variants that we encounter in later examples are going to be more subtle. Now, this is basically the idea of invariant and how we uh, 
guarantee that our loops terminate but now we are going to generalize the discussion a bit and do and indulge maybe in a, into in a bit of philosophy but it's very important philosophy it's very, it's very uh, fundamental in computer science for example you might say why do i have to invent a variant why cannot i ask my develop an environment, Eiffel Studio in our case, or Eclipse, or, or some other compiler, why, cannot, uh, why can't I ask my tools to find out uh, that my loops will terminate and tell me if they won't? After all, compilers do all kinds of things for us. I'm sure that if you've started to use Eiffel Studio, you've already started to see all these things that the compiler checks for you, that you don't manipulate an integer like a real number, or a person like a city, there's all these type checks, so why can't Eiffel Studio do, uh, do the same thing? Well, the answer is that it can't. Haha, this is what we get for using Eiffel, right? If we were using some other programming language and some other compiler and environment than Eiffel Studio, we would get a better result. That's what you think? Well, I hope not, because this has nothing to do with Eiffel, it has nothing to do with Java. You can take a Java compiler, you can take a C compiler, you can take a Python compiler, you can take a Haskell compiler, nothing is going to change in this respect. No other program for any other realistic programming language can make this kind of determination. It is very, very, very sad and it's a realization of our limitations. And I'm not joking here, it is a general result that uh, tells us that no general determination of the termination of a program uh, can be done by an automaton, by an automatic mechanism. You might say this is something, you might believe this is something recent, in fact it's an old result, you see the, the date uh, here, 1936, which is of course particularly interesting because in 1936 we didn't have any computers as we have them now, but still there was this uh, landmark paper by the British computer scientist Alan Turing, which worked with an abstract mathematical model of what a computer of then the future could be, discussing what is sometimes known as the Entscheidungsproblem, uh, a German term which means the decision problem. It's a term that goes back, I believe, to Leibniz. And uh, it was a famous problem among mathematicians at the time. And Turing showed this so-called undecidability result. Undecidability mean, meaning that it is not possible to devise an effective procedure that solves a problem, in this particular case, the problem of termination. It is not possible to write an effective procedure, for example, a program that will find out if an arbitrary program will terminate on arbitrary input. And so we're talking about programs that work on other programs, but of course there's nothing strange with that. When you feed your Eiffel program through Eiffel Studio or when you feed your uh, Java program through Eclipse, you are feeding a program to another program. So it's completely, uh, yeah, the, the compiler is a uh, program that processes other programs. And we might think that such a compiler could also find out about termination, but it can't. Why can't it? Well, the full proof of undecidability as given by Turing is definitely beyond what we can uh, do uh, here, but in fact uh, we can see quite precisely why termination, general ter the general termination problem is undecidable. In fact, uh, we can see a simple version of the proof which is quite straightforward and which, uh, which uses Eiffel directly. Even though it uses a programming language, it's actually a mathematical proof. So let's assume we can find out whether an arbitrary program terminates. This means solving the termination problem, also known as the halting problem. This was Turing's original terminology. So if we could solve the general halting problem, we could write a function terminates in Eiffel or some other programming language, a Boolean valued function, which tells us true or false, yes or no, this particular program, this arbitrary program text that we give it as input, will terminate or not. There's nothing strange here in feeding a program text into another program. This is exactly what a compiler does. When you feed an Eiffel program to an Eiffel compiler or a C program to a C compiler, that's exactly what happens. You have some 
program element, the compiler, that uh, takes the text of, a pro of another program uh, given as a string, and then it checks it and it compiles it. So if we can check for types, can't we also check for a termination? Well, let's assume we can. So uh, this means that we will be able to write this function terminates. And if we can write this function terminates, we can also write the following loop. We have a loop which starts with from, like all loops, and actually there is no initialization. We don't need initialization until not terminates of t. I'll tell you what t is in a second. Loop, loop what? Nothing. Okay, the loop body is empty. And so this is not a full program, it's just a loop which we put into a routine, which we put into a class, and now you know how to do this. You can take a, co a computation like this, and uh, by putting it into a class and then uh, building the system uh, around it, you can just uh, uh, make it into an entire system. So we skip the details here, but they're not difficult. We, in the end, we're going to have a program text, and t, this string here, is going to be that full program text. So we are actually, uh, in the uh, loop itself, have the uh, program uh, text that encompasses that loop. And so now you see what happens. Does t terminate? Does this particular uh, program here terminate or not? Well, if it terminates, then because we have this function terminates, then uh, terminates is going to uh, give us the result true. But then, because we loop until not terminates holds, not terminates is never going to hold, so we loop forever. In other words, if the program terminates, then it does not terminate. Now, let's assume that it does not terminate. This means that terminates of t is false. So not terminates of t is immediately satisfied and the loop doesn't do anything, it stops immediately. So we have a program that terminates if and only if it does not terminate. And of course, this is a contradiction and impossibility. And this is a simple form of Turing's original 1936 proof. Of course, it's much simpler and it's adapted to the modern context of programming languages. But basically, this is the essence of the proof. And it shows that it's impossible, however sad we may be about it, it's impossible to write a general mechanism or to devise an effective procedure that in all cases will tell us whether an arbitrary program terminates or not. Now, I said it's a sad result, and in fact, to, uh, to a certain extent it is. This is not quite a joke because it's part of this whole set of results that science encountered in the beginning of the 20th century, in the first half of the 20th century, not just in mathematics, in fact, but it's also in physics, for example, you know about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which tells us that we cannot, with equal precision, determine the speed and the position of a particle. So these are examples of limitations to our ability to understand the world in, in, in physics and in mathematics, our ability to reason about the world. And the, the, in the end, the undecidability of the halting problem is just one variant of a whole set of negative results that exist in logic and mathematics. So just for a bit of entertainment, here are some of these other uh, results. I'm saying entertainment, of course, but of course this is extremely serious stuff, which led at the beginning of the 20th century to a complete re-examination of the basis of mathematics. So one version of this is Russell's paradox, which is about sets that do not contain themselves. Now, many sets are members of themselves. For example, if you take the set of all infinite sets, assuming, of course, this is a well-defined notion, well, the set of all infinite sets is infinite. There's an infinity of infinite, set, of infinite sets. On the other hand, some sets are not members of themselves. For example, the set of all finite sets is not finite. It's clear that there's an infinite set of uh, finite, there's an infinity, at least, of finite sets. So now consider the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. We immediately get to a contradiction. Is, uh, is that set a member of itself or not? If it's a member of itself, then it is not a member of itself because that's the definition and the other way around. 
So now we are left to uh, tearing our hair apart. Now, if we have any hair left, we go to the barber. The, the, the barber's uh, paradox is due to Bertrand Russell. So I've changed the gender uh, here, but it's the same idea. In Paris, there's a makeup woman who does the makeup of all the women who don't do their own makeup. And next question, who does the makeup of the you know, that makeup woman? And uh, you, you start thinking about the, uh, the possible answers and you realize that uh, neither of them makes sense because if she makes her, her hair, she doesn't make her hair and, and conversely. So what this shows is that we're getting down to very simple issues uh, of logic, uh, e even things that might even appear at first to be almost uh, jokes, but they are not. And in all cases, and this was also uh, the case with the example with terminates, we have this idea of self-inclusion, of negation of self and self-inclusion. So, you know, again, for entertainment, here are a few variants which are well known by logicians. Uh, this the so-called Grunning's paradox. Let's say that an, an, an adjective in English or some other language is autological if it applies to itself. So, for example, English is an English adjective. Polysyllabic, meaning several syllables, is, is polysyllabic. And if it's not applicable to itself, then the adjective is heterological. So, for example, monosyllabic is not a mono, is not a monosyllabic adjective because it contains several syllables. So, what about heterological? And you easily see that if it's heterological, it's not, and conversely. Yet another variant, you can see that we get to very elementary stuff in the end. The first statement that appears in red on this slide is false. And for those of you who are colorblind, this statement is indeed red. Right? So, uh, contradiction. This actually goes very, very far. The Greeks had that paradox known as the liar's paradox or the paradox of Epaminondas. Epaminondas was a Cretan, and he says that all... Cretans are liars. So should we believe him or not? Uh, whichever answer you choose, you get to a contradiction. So this is, was just a, a little digression to show that we're getting into very fundamental and in fact quite deep problems of logic. But in computer science, the particular case is uh, the impossibility of solving the halting problem. That is to say the impossibility of determining whether an arbitrary a program will terminate or not, and it's just one of many undecidability results in, in programming and computer science in general. There are many general problems that cannot have a general solution, and I emphasize cannot. It's not just that they don't have a solution now, it's that it's provable that they cannot ever have a general solution. Now, what does this mean? Does it mean that we should renounce termination of our loops? Absolutely not. We know that it's impossible to devise a general mechanism. We know, for example, that we cannot rely on the compiler, but our loops should terminate, and we have, we have to guarantee that the loops terminate in all cases. So if a program does not terminate in certain cases, regardless of what Turing showed in 1936, it's a bug. And you know, if you if I, in the final exam of a course, you deliver a program that sometimes does not terminate, I don't think that it's Turing's fault is going to uh, gain you much sympathy from the grader of the exam. Or if you're a consultant and deliver a program that hangs, uh, your customer is not going to be very impressed if you start invoking undecidability. You, you'd better make sure that your programs terminate. And how do you do this? Well, you associate a variant. And in fact, it is possible for advanced tools which are starting to exist now to determine that something that you claim to be a variant is indeed a variant and so that your program terminates. And there's no contradiction here. The undecidability problem tells us that it is not general to, it's not possible to have a general mechanism which for all programs will tell us automatically whether the program terminates or not. But it doesn't tell us that it's impossible to determine that a particular program will terminate. And that's What's of interest to us, we're interested in our own particular programs, not in the general philosophical problem. So that's the end of this discussion of variance and termination and decidability. What we've seen is that 
programs run the risk of not terminating. We have also seen that, unfortunately, there is no general rule to find out whether an arbitrary program will terminate. However, that changes little of the practical scene, the practical picture, because in the practical picture, we have to make sure our programs terminate. So make sure you know the variant of every loop. This is your key to making sure that, as this particular lecture, every one of your programs will indeed terminate.